Could I encourage you, if you were not here this morning, to make sure that you're staying up to date with our Sunday morning messages. I had such a blast teaching Daniel chapter 7 this morning and seeing the Lord describe for us 2,573 years ago this coming kingdom and the Antichrist that is going to come into power. It was fantastic. Um, Revelation is not difficult to understand. Why? Why is that? Why is Revelation not difficult? Yes, that outline, that inspired outline is found where? Chapter 1, verse 19. You're not going to fully understand the book of Revelation unless you get down. Chapter 1, verse 19. And if anybody needs a Bible to follow along, Myron's got some back there for you. Um, we're going to, I'm going to attempt to do two chapters tonight. We'll see how it goes. Um, we'll look at chapters 8 and 9, hopefully this morning. But chapter 1, verse 19 is so important because John is specifically told, write the things you have seen, chapter 1, everything leading up to verse 19, write the things which are, chapters 2 and 3, the church age, and then write the things metatonic after this, after the church age. We're in this third section now, because that takes place in chapters 4 through 22, these after things, after chapters 1 through 3, after the church. And this section as well, I'm going to do a little bit more of just backing up and reviewing here and getting a head start. <clears throat> uh, we've talked about this before, but the after this things that John is told to describe can be broken up and outlined as well. In chapters 4 and 5, the church is seen in heaven. They're experiencing this seven-year period of intimacy with the Lord, this honeymoon experience with him. And meanwhile, while that is taking place in heaven, on earth, things are getting difficult. Chapters 6 through 19 describe the period that the Bible talks about as the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, where God is pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. And uh, I think we've talked about this maybe several weeks ago in one of our first studies in Revelation. But I wanted to remind us tonight about reasons for the rapture. Um, reason number one is to shake up the unbeliever. When we're gone, when we're taken off the scene, caught up into heaven. Those folks who say, I, don't know, I never really bought into all that church stuff. I'm glad Jesus works for you. I'm glad you found something to do on a Sunday morning. But I've got my own thing. And so for those who are left behind, God is going to use this time period of the tribulation to get people's attention. People are going to be saved during this time. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. People are going to lose their lives for the cause of Christ, but people will be saved. And so reason number one is to shake up the unbeliever. Reason number two for the rapture is to wake up the nation. As we talked about uh, this morning in Daniel, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene. That is reality. That is fact. He is going to promise the nation of Israel peace. He's going to be able to finally solve this Middle East peace puzzle that has forever, for decades, gone on and on, and for centuries, gone on and on, and no one can solve it. He's going to have a plan to put in place, and uh, after a period of time, Israel is going to recognize what is going on. They're going to see his true colors, they're going to turn their backs on him, and 144,000 are going to be saved, and through their ministry, even more from the nation of Israel will finally accept Jesus as the Messiah. And so, reason number one is to shake up the unbeliever. Reason number two, wake up the nation. And number three is to make up the kingdom. All the nations of the earth, those who are left, who have hardened their hearts to the Lord, are going to come together finally to get rid of Israel in the valley of Megiddo. 
And Jesus in chapter 19 is going to show up on a white horse with ten thousands of ten thousands of his saints. And uh, he's going to come down on the Mount of Olives, the Antichrist and the false prophet. We referenced this this morning. They're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Then in chapter 20, we have the millennium. Satan is chained up for a thousand years in the bottomless pit, uh, which we... Uh, we'll read about tonight, and there's peace and prosperity on the earth for 1,000 years. Swords are beaten into plowshares. Spears are fashioned into pruning hooks. These things that were in at first intended to make war are made for agriculture. And then at the end of that 1,000 years, Satan is released from the bottomless pit for one final uprising, but he's going to be crushed authoritatively, looking forward to that moment. And then in chapter 21 and 22, there's a new heaven, a new earth, and we all live happily ever after. So that is the outline uh, of the book of Revelation, the reasons for the tribulation. And we find ourselves tonight in chapter 8 during this period of difficulty. And uh, the Lamb Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, he's taken the seal, the scroll, the title deed to planet Earth in chapter 5. And at the breaking of the first seal in chapter 6, John gets his first glimpse into this future worldwide tribulation period. And as Jesus breaks open each seal of judgment, there's devastation, there's death, there's war, there's famine, there's destruction, murders, disease. And as I've mentioned, I don't know if we, we have slides, Spency? What's my new yes. name for you? Yes. Do we have the trumpet? What are you doing? I'm keeping it super duty. What? Oh, you have the iPhone. Oh, goodness. <laughs> You're pointing at me. Uh, the, the, the seals, the trumpets, the vials, uh, or bowls, it can be very complicated if you're not familiar with the book of Revelation, how all those fit together, and I'll just tell you I have all these little ways of how I remember things and how I remember the order. I don't know if it'll work for you. But sometimes you'll notice that I call them vials instead of bowls. It's because when I do it that way, they're in alphabetical order. It's seals, trumpets, vials. So, uh, anyway, I'm already off track here. I'm not hoping to go through two chapters. We'll see how that works out. But it can be... Uh, these judgments, these three sets of judgments, uh, I've described them before as kind of like nesting dolls. You get to this one, oh, there's another one in there, and you keep going, and so you get to the seventh seal, and oh, now there's seven trumpets. You get to the seventh trumpet, oh, now there's seven vials. And uh, maybe another way to think about it is in these three, hey, there you go. In these three sets of judgments, it's kind of like, I'm sure they're all digital now, everything's digital, but when I was in school, way back in the 80s and 90s, um, last century, uh, microscopes, you know, they, you would look through and it'd be like 15x or something, and then you'd tune it in and then turn it clockwise and then it'd be 30x. And you're looking at the same thing, but you're looking at a magnified portion of the same thing. You turn it again, and then it's like 90x of the exact same thing, just with more detail. And so, in a way, it's kind of like that. It's this telescopic nature to these judgments, as we'll see. Uh, chapter 6 took us through six of these seven seals, and the, uh, the earth is in turmoil. Men are, if you can believe this, they're, they're hiding out in caves, under rocks, pleading for the mountains to fall on them, saying, who can stand? Who can stand uh, against the wrath of the Lamb? And now the seventh seal is about to be opened up. That was the first six. And uh, as we've mentioned, though, by breaking open this seventh seal is just going to release more judgments. But before that happened, last week we saw this judgment going on the earth. There's a break in chapter 7. A flashback, a chapter about how the tribulation saints are preserved through this time period. These 144,000 Jewish evangelists are, have the seal of God on them. That's verses 1 through 8. And uh, it would seem that through their ministry, verses 9 through 17, 
described this, this group that was saved, made up of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And they're giving praise, they're, they're being comforted by Jesus. And so the scene shifts <clears throat> from back and forth from earth to heaven. This is something that we're going to see throughout the book of Revelation, okay? In chapters 1 through 3, if you're following what I'm saying, is on the earth. And then in chapters 4 and 5, the scene is up in heaven. In chapter 6 through 7, we're back on earth. Right? And then now back to heaven, chapter 8, 1 through 15, it's going to be back on earth, 8, 6 through 14, 20, it's going to be in heaven. In chapter 15, back on earth, 16 and 20, chapter 21, 22, there's going to be a new heaven, new earth, no more back and forth. But as this seventh seal is broken, with it come the trumpet judgments, and we see the calm before the storm. Chapter 8, finally, okay, here we go. When he opened the seventh seal, that is Jesus, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Even with all the crazy things we see. We go back to chapter 6, and, and, and you read the things that are taking place, or these wild events that are happening. This might be the wildest thing to happen yet. Now, there are those... We talked about this in our first session, different ways to view and study Revelation. There are those who do not take the book of Revelation literally or in a futuristic sense. And so they would tell you that this half an hour of silence equals exactly 70 years earth time. I don't know how they come up with that uh, type of map, but this half an hour of silence actually correlates to the time period of 325 AD to 395. AD. Why 325 to 395 AD? Because in 325 AD, uh, Christianity became the religion of Rome. It became endorsed by Rome. In 395, the Roman Empire split, and with it, uh, the Catholic Church split as well. And so I tend to think that when it says it was silent in heaven for half an hour, it was silent in heaven for half an hour. It's just a little easier way for me to understand this, but can you imagine this scene, you know, um, imagine that next year uh, TJ has tickets to the Super Bowl in Atlanta. He's got two, and I'm sorry Stephanie, he's taking me. <laughs> and we're there watching the Seahawks play, and hopefully against the Patriots, just because I don't want to beat them, and yeah. get back for that. I want to throw it on the one-yard line. I'm getting sidetracked. Okay. <laughs> We're at the game. It's the fourth quarter. The fans are, it's in the dome in Atlanta. It gets loud. It's getting crazy in there. It's raucous. The cheerleaders are cheering. The players are grunting. The coaches are yelling. The fans are screaming. It's just nuts. And, and Russell Wilson is dropping back to pass. There's an open man in the end zone. The ball is in the air. In an instant, everything stops. Frozen in time, except me and TJ. All the, the fans, the cheerleaders, still have their legs in the air. Everything is, is, is stopped. Every bit is just shh. And there's silence. And you can hear the ball. Just, in this huge stadium full of 60,000 people, just, you can hear it hit the turf. That would be the eeriest thing. The silence is, is deafening. It's, it's, it's frightening. Or if, if you can imagine just if I was teaching sometime on a Sunday morning, Wednesday night, on Sunday night here, and all of a sudden I just stopped. How uncomfortable is that, you know? You're supposed to be talking. Keep going. Keep doing it. Uh, but for, this is the eeriest. We're so used to, to noise, you know, whatever it is. It, the, the, maybe you can hear even the lights or you're at home and the refrigerator is just humming or whatever, the iPod's on, the music's going, whatever it is, the wind is blowing outside, there's just always sound. But if just for a minute it all stopped. Now, as we can have seen, heaven has not been a place where you sit on your hands. <laughs> that is not what we have seen in chapters 4 and 5 at all, where people are just kind of, you know, ho oh, hum. In chapter 4, let me just remind you, the living creatures, day and night, night and day, just continue on, 
holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to, is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever they broke out in praise, it tells us that the 24 elders would shout out, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and praise, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. By the time we get to the end of chapter 5, every creature in heaven is crying out, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Last week in chapter 7, we saw this great multitude that no one could number also erupting in praise. To this point, heaven is noisy. It is, it is organized, but it is just, it's wild. It's, there's so much noise and, and, and praise and sound. But now as the seventh seal is broken open, it's deafening with the quiet. Millions and millions of creatures and faces and saints who have been crying out and worshiping and praising suddenly stop. And for the first time, perhaps in eternity, the only time that we know of in the Bible, heaven is completely quiet. It's incredible. It's an incredible moment. If you take notes, I encourage you to jot down Habakkuk 2, verse 20 here. Habakkuk 2 20 says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Seventh seal. Worship, worship, worship. Day and night, night and day. Holy, holy, holy. Seventh seal. Quiet. And, and it's not like, well, these other seals, every time one was broken, something dramatic happened. Is this like a dud of fireworks, you know? Like we did seventh seal and nothing happened. Uh, no, something important is about to happen. What happens, verse 2. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now, I think this is interesting. Don't turn there. We don't have time for that necessarily, but listen to this from Joshua 6, verses 9 and 10. This is uh, talking about the Battle of Jericho. You guys know the story. It says, The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. At the breaking of the seventh seal, there's silence, there's quiet for half an hour, and the seven trumpets of judgment given to the seven angels, verse 3. Then another angel, some scholars believe this is Jesus. I'll let you make up your own mind. He is our great high priest. This other angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, but he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The prayers of the saints are, are ascending before the Lord. They're coming up like incense to him. And this picture takes us back to the tabernacle. It takes us back to the temple where two times a day at the hour of prayer, the priests would, would take coals and incense and place it on the golden altars. And so now all these prayers are coming up before God. And it's as though God says to the living creatures who are crying out, holy, 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 shh, silence, silence. Quiet to the 24 elders. Now is not the time to the thousands of angels. Shh, I, I need you to, to be quiet right now. My attention is fully on the prayers being offered to me. I appreciate the worship, but right now, I need you to be quiet. I don't want to miss a single word, a single prayer. Verse 4, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And again, let's not compartmentalize what's going on in heaven with what's going on on planet Earth. Here, I, I, the, the earth, the people on Earth that God cares so much about are just they're hanging on by a thread right now. There's more judgment coming. And here we see the impact and the power of answered prayer as the prayers of the saints are, are ascending to the Lord as with incense, with the 
poles, you know, going up, and they're being hurled back to the earth. And as it's done, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven, is about to become a reality. Things are incredibly serious. Those who prayed in chapter 6, verse 10, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood of those who dwell on the earth, that request is about to be answered from heaven to earth. And so the silence is broken after a half an hour, the longest half an hour is in all of eternity, and it's broken dramatically. Verse 6, so the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. I skipped it for the last word, verse 5. I'm going to this thing. Filled the fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thundering, lightnings, and earthquake. Is that me doing that? Sorry. Ignore that. Ignore me. So, verse 6, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, these seven trumpets, trumpets are seen throughout the Bible. It's the most common instrument that we see in the Bible, and they have many different uses throughout the Old Testament. One, they were used as a call to worship, and the trumpet would sound this certain, whatever blast it was, it was time to, to gather to worship. Number two, it was used as a time to, when they would blast it, it would be a draw to assembly. And number three, when the trumpet was sounded, it meant it was time to engage in battle. And so, verse seven, the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. First trumpet, hail, bloody rain, mixed with fire. We jot down Joel 2, verse 30. It says this, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Certainly the prophet Joel is speaking of these events. Now, because of the earthquake that was mentioned before, here some believe that the volcanic eruptions, pollution, meteors, that these trumpets may describe and be the results of a nuclear exchange. And we can't say that with certainty, but it certainly seems possible. We'll talk about that idea in just a little bit. But whatever the cause is, whether it is God uses man-made instruments to cause this judgment, or he has his own way of doing it, it's his plan, and he can judge it however he wants. And so with the first trumpet, it affects the land. One-third of the vegetation of the planet is burned up. Verse 8, then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, that's a lot of ships. In January uh, of 2017, in regards to merchant ships, there was 52,183 merchant ships registered on the ocean. It says here that a third of the, uh, the sea became blood. And I'm just, I'm not being dogmatic. I'm just throwing this out there for you. The Atlantic Ocean uh, covers roughly about a third, uh, is about a third of all ocean surface. It's 29% of the ocean. So uh, something dramatic is going on. And again, those who want to take away from the, the devastation and the, the dramaticness of this say, well, John's describing a red tide, you know, and the seafood is dying in that area. But John is very specific here. He says there's something like, he's not saying it, it is, there's something like a mountain burning with fire. But what it caused, he's sure about. What it caused is one third of the sea to become blood. And, and in your back of your minds, I want you to be thinking as we go through this uh, about uh, the beginning of, of Exodus and about the plagues. And this is very reminiscent of plague number one in Egypt. And that wasn't allegorical, that was literal. And uh, if you could just 
they, I don't know, you want to imagine. There's not many things worse to imagine, but the smell that this would cause. One third of the ocean blood. Dead animals, a third of all sea creatures, dead. It was rotting seafood mixed with blood. Oh, it was just nasty. Chapter 10, it's the first two. The third angel sounded, and a great star, or it, it means a, a heavenly body, it could be a meteor, it could be anything like that, fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. Now, this is really interesting, a little factoid for you. In Russian, Wormwood is Chernobyl. That is how you pronounce Wormwood. That is it's crazy. When this happens, a third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Now, in each of these first three trumpets, one third of an ecological system is destroyed in judgment. In the first one, it's the land, the vegetation. In the second one, it's the salt water. In the third one, it's fresh water. Now, when it says that this heavenly body fell, again, I don't know exactly what it's talking about, but if you looked at a telescope, well, it's better to look through a telescope. That's more interesting than looking at a telescope. But <laughs> if you look through a telescope at uh, the moon and just really blow it up, and you see how pitted it is, right? That it's recorded, it's estimated that 18,000 meteors burn up in our atmosphere per second when they hit the atmosphere, they, they burn up, you know, shooting stars, all of that. So maybe something like that is going on, but one in every three lakes, one in every three rivers, the water becomes poison. And whatever's going on in the world, people are already, because of what happened with trumpet one and trumpet two, they're gonna be desperate to find drinking water. And when they do, many, uh, what they believe is going to be good drinking water are gonna find, in fact, that it's bitter poisoned. And so, that's the first three. Verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So land, salt water, fresh water, now the atmosphere. We're Maybe you can jot down here, Matthew 24, verse 2. Jesus says the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And uh, this would have incredibly catastrophic effects on planet Earth. The vegetation that did survive from trumpet one now almost has no hope of growing. And, and there's going to be this global cooling period. Temperatures are going to plummet worldwide. And before, I had said that all these events could be the cause of a nuclear exchange. It does sound perhaps like what is called nuclear winter. And I, I would say authoritatively that that is what it is. Again, I will let you be Marines, Acts 17, 11. You search the scriptures. You you find out if it's true, but I do want to throw it out there as food for thought. Listen to a couple of these facts on what the effects of a nuclear exchange would be. Um, a nuclear flash can ignite fires even in areas far enough away to escape the blast. That sounds like trumpet one, perhaps. Uh, dark, flammable surface, surfaces facing the fireball are especially vulnerable but all damaged structures carry their own fire risk, especially from broken electrical wiring and natural gas leaks. Red-orange color is due to the ionization of the air molecules predominantly produced by preceding fireballs' intense heat. The pressure wave from the underground explosion will propagate through the ground and cause a minor earthquake. Theory suggests that a nuclear explosion could trigger 
fault rupture and cause major quakes at distances uh, several kilometers from the shock point. At the explosion of nuclear bombs, lightning discharges sometimes occur. The heat in the airborne debris created by a nuclear explosion can cause rain. Debris is thought to do this by acting as cloud condensation nuclei. During the city firestorm, which followed the Hiroshima explosion, drops of water were reported to be the size of marbles. It is theorized that detonating large numbers of nuclear weapons could have a profound, profound and severe effect on the climate, causing cold weather and reduced sunlight for a period of months or even years. The dictionary the nuclear winter says a long period of darkness and extreme cold that scientists predict would follow a full-scale nuclear war. A layer of dust and smoke in the atmosphere would cover the earth and block the rays of the sun. Most living organisms would perish. Could be. It could be. I don't want to say for sure that's what it is, but it could be. It sounds a lot like what we're seeing here in Revelation. Eight. That said, these judgments are very, very similar to the plagues of Egypt, and those were not the result of nuclear weapons. So, that's what happens. The reaction, verse 13, I looked, and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Now, he doesn't say, wow, 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 hey, there's going to be more fireworks, more awesome stuff is going to happen, but whoa, whoa, whoa. This is the heart of God being expressed here. There's more judgment coming. He's warning folks that there's three more trumpets coming. The worst is yet to come. The last three, unbelievably, are going to be worse than the first four. The first four trumpets deal with the natural world. The last three are going to be supernatural. And another one-third of the Earth's population is going to perish. And so now, for those whose hearts have continued to be hard toward God, the supernatural judgment ensues. Verse 1 of chapter 9. Then the, I did that pretty quick. There's one chapter. All right. Hey, verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from earth to heaven. Okay. To him, oh, now it's got a masculine pronoun. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now, I like bottomless soft drinks. I like it when my coffee has free refills. But when you're talking about supernatural, that's not good. That's, you don't want bottomless anything. We're going to see the pit mentioned a few more times in the book of Revelation. It's also called the abyss. It's this place of captivity for the especially demonic demons, as if regular demons aren't demonic enough. This is for the extra demonic ones. And uh, the abyss is mentioned not just here. It's mentioned several times in Scripture. It's mentioned in First and Second Peter. It's mentioned in the book of Jude. It's also mentioned in the Gospels. And maybe you remember that account. It's in Luke 8, Matthew 8, and Mark 5. It's Luke 8, Matthew 8, and Mark 5. And we have the story. You guys are familiar with it. The demon-possessed man in the country of Gadarenes. He's got no clothes. He's cutting himself. He's living in a graveyard. And he keeps busting out of the chain. And people try to, to bind him up. And he keeps breaking out of it. Uh, his name, he says, is Legion, for we are many. Jesus tells him in, in, in those places for the demons to, the evil spirits to come out of him. The spirit's response in Luke 8.31 says they begged him, that is Jesus, that he would not command them to go into the abyss. And again, you guys know the story. Instead, they don't send us to the abyss. There's some pigs. Can we go to the pigs? Because evil spirits desire to embody something or someone. And uh, the other alternative is the abyss. They say, we don't want to go there. Send us into the, the, the herd of pigs. But what we know from that account in the Gospels is that the pit is controlled by God. 
He is the one that has access to it. And here, the key to the pit, to the abyss, is given, as John says, to a star that's fallen, past him, fallen from heaven to earth. Now, throughout the Bible, angelic beings are also referred to as stars. Again, you take notes, we're not going to take the time to turn there, but here's four references for you where angelic beings are referred to as stars. Job 38, verse 7. Isaiah 14, verse 13. Revelation 2, 3. And Revelation 12, 4. And so I believe he's talking about Satan here. Jesus said in Luke 10, verse 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus says, that's what happens. Well, that's kind of what happens here. I saw a star falling from heaven to earth. And so here we see God, heaven, giving permission to Satan, hell, handing him the key to this demonic pit. We go through the rest of the account of what comes out of the, the pit. John is going to have a really, really hard time being precise about what he sees and what he's looking at. I think there's going to be 11 different times in these next couple verses where John says, it was like this, or it was as that. You know, it's going to, He's going to have a hard time describing that for us. He can't exactly determine what he's seeing, but it's not good. And uh, now to think about the pit, and uh, if this is Satan, he is given the key to this pit and to release what is in there. Uh, there's nothing that we as well could say it's like this, but if we were to try, if you would imagine every prison and jail in the world suddenly releasing its prisoners, that's child's play compared to what is about to take place. And so it says, after he's given the key, verse 2 of chapter 9, he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit. That's not so bad so far. Like the smoke of a great furnace. And there's a lot of smoke, though. So that the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Now, this is some extra thick, extra dark smoke that's coming out. The sun, the air, it's all darkened. And if that wasn't bad enough, then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. This is sounding more and more like a horror movie. The average locust storm, swarm, excuse me, uh, have you ever seen pictures of the devastation that locusts and swarms can cause? But the average swarm is 40 million locusts. And here, this smoke doesn't bother them. They, it seems like it charges them up. And so, this is a demonic bug here that we're talking about. And they, verse 4, were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. Now, here's what's really unique about this. Is this is, these are demonic, this is unlike, it's pointing out these are unlike natural locusts. That's what natural Locusts eat is green things, it's vegetation. But they're not going after the vegetation. Instead, only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We've seen these guys divinely protected in chapter 7, and here the locusts are going after only those who did not have that seal of protection on them. And these locusts, verse 5, they were not given authority to kill them. That might sound good. It's not. But to torment them for five months. All of this is controlled by God. He, he has his hand on all of this. They're commanded not to touch the vegetation. They are not given authority to kill. And they are given authority to torment. And it goes on and says their torment it was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. The scorpion sting causes severe pain, swelling, and even death. Ironically, one of the most 
deadly scorpions in the world is called an Israeli death stalker, which I just think it sounds like a wrestler name. I love that. It's amazing. An Israeli death stalker. Yes. Okay. But these locust scorpions won't kill you. They're, they'll torment you for five months. And so bad, so intense is the pain. Verse 6, in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Now, I don't know if this means people are going to shoot themselves in the head, you know, and it's not going to work or jump off of the whole building. I don't know how exactly it's going to work out, but it's going to be insanely hard for them to bear. I want to die. I want to die. I don't want to live anymore. And you may think, as I said before, all of this is controlled by God. You may think, how mean. I can't believe that God would do something like that. It wouldn't it be merciful to let them kill themselves at this point. But God knows after this, these guys who have their hearts so hard, unrepentant, won't turn to him. God knows after this, at death, comes eternal judgment. It would be meanness that would... It's not meanness that's keeping them from killing themselves. It's God's mercy. It's his love. It's his grace. He will do, because he's doing here, he's allowing this so that whatever it takes, even if it's torment that someone is going through, that that's what it'll be for them to turn to him. That's what it will be. That finally, they will turn to them to get man's attention. Now, it was on in chapter 7, or verse 7, and describes the locusts even more. It says, the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. Well, your exterminator is not going to be able to deal with that. I'm sorry. I don't care how good he is. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. Now, let me read to you what Joel says. In Joel chapter 2, write that in your margins here. Uh, listen to how Joel describes this. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like swift steeds, so they run. With the noise like chariots, over the mountaintops they leap. Like, like the noise of flaming fire that devours the stubble. Like a strong people set in battle array. Before them the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into houses. They enter the windows like a thief. The earthquakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. This is demonic, what is going on here. Incredibly demonic. It is from the pit. It is from the abyss. And so these guys, it's going to tell us in verse 11, have a king over them. And this is another thing that separates them from uh, natural locusts. Uh, Proverbs 30, 27 says, the locusts don't have a king, but these guys do. It says, they have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destruction. But in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon, which is destroyer. John is saying, I don't care what language you speak, the one that's given the authority over these locusts is a destroyer. He is into destruction. That's what he is after, to destroy life. Just as God will use whatever means necessary to bring you to repentance, Satan will use those same things to bring you to destruction. That's why it's, it's always up to us to make the decision. Am I going to allow this to bring me to a place of repentance, or am I going to allow this to destroy me? And that's that's what Satan wants to get us to. Get us to the point to get as many people as possible to say, I don't want this life. I want to die. I'm done. I can't go on. When that's our attitude, it's from the pit of hell. That's where it comes from. Now, verse 12. 
One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So trumpet five is over. Six and seven are on the way. And in trumpet six, the, the judgment is from bad to worse, if you can believe it. Verse 13, then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Now, Euphrates is an old river. It's one of the most popular rivers. It's one of the first rivers mentioned in the Bible. It talks about it being the boundary of Eden. It's the boundary of the promised land for Abram. It's the place of the first sin. It's the place of the first murder, the first organized revolt against God. It's the place where Nimrod uh, you know, wanted to, to, to battle against man and against God. And it's from these, this place we see these demonic angels released, but yet we see God is sovereignly in control of all of this. Verse 15. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. That's heavy. But what I want us to think about at this moment is that there is comfort here. These guys are released at a very specific time. God knows the precise moment. He has a specific year, month, day, and hour in which this happens. And he determines the moment they are to be released. And he lifts this five-month ban on death, and they are released to kill one-third of mankind. And if you remember from chapter 6, one quarter of humanity was already killed in the seal judgments. And if you add this to it, now one half of humanity has been killed. And the angel here enlists an army to assist him. Verse 16, now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. And I love this. I heard the number of them. John's like, don't worry, I didn't count all of them. <laughs> One, two, 200 million cows. Okay, 200 million. Verse 17, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouth came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which came out of their mouth. For the power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. Now, some say that John is describing here as best he can something that is completely outside of his point of reference. And he's describing guns and tanks and missile launchers and Apache helicopters. And he's describing modern weaponry and that the 200 million is perhaps China's military. And you know, to, to have a 200 million men on a horse, the number of the army of a horseman was 200 million, that is about the entire population of the world when John wrote this. That's what's so incredible about it is that there was about 200 million people on the planet. He's saying there's a whole military, an army made up of that many. The Roman army, we talked about the, the, the Romans this morning in Daniel, the, the, the fierce Roman Empire just pushing and pushing Pax Romanum upon Western Europe and as far as they could go. Their military was 125 active soldiers. And John is saying, this army is 200 million. Now, I, mean, I, I want to give both sides of this. Uh, Revelation 16, verse 2, mentions that there are kings from the east. Daniel 11, 44 and 45 talks about an army from the east. And so it's possible that China or a coalition of eastern nations comprise this army of 200 million. That is feasible and possible today, right now. 
that, that China and North Korea, and if they could get some other nations around them in the East to join in, they could easily get a military of 200 million assembled. And so that is possible. But it also may refer to, like the locust, that this is a, a demonic army that is being released, that is assembled. But whoever it is, and whatever it is, it's going to be the source of the greatest loss of life at one time ever in human history. Uh, you know, Elijah is, my kid's the third kid in a row now that is going on this East Coast trip with the school. And uh, I was able to go to the East Coast years ago, and I went to Gettysburg. Has anybody here that's been to Gettysburg? It is amazing. Uh, just to, the thing that struck me the most as you're walking through this battlefield where uh, almost 50,000 people died in three days. The same amount as died in the Vietnam War, died in three days at Gettysburg. And you're walking along and you see a gravestone that says, here lies 348 unknown soldiers. And then you go to, just a little bit further. Here lies 142 unknown soldiers. And you just keep going on and on and on. It's nothing. That's only 50,000. Here, by this time, half of humanity is going to be killed at this point. It's going to be devastating. How? is literally breaking out on earth when the abyss is opened up. And in all of this, God is trying to touch the hearts of men. But mankind's response is still, I don't want you. We're still refusing to turn in. Verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, or their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Can you believe that? As hard as it is to believe what is happening the response is almost as hard to read. It's almost unbelievable that hearts could be so hard. Think, just think for a moment. Step back and look at everything that we've read through the book of Revelation thus far. The church is gone in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and they refuse to turn. There's been earthquakes, disasters, no turning to God. 144,000 have been saved and, and sealed. They're preaching the gospel. They refuse to turn. Now, they're, they're, they're living through a horror movie. For five months, people are permitted uh, from taking their own lives, which is a foretaste of hell in and of itself. And, and, and no, still not doing it. Not turning. Not repenting. Why? tells us in verse 20 that they're too caught up in the things of this world. They did not repent of the work of their hands, that they should not worship demons, idols, gold, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear or walk. They won't worship Jesus because they're worshiping these things and the demonic, demonic entities behind them. Everybody worships something. That's who we are. We're created as worshipers. Now, maybe they didn't know, or they didn't have a understand that they're worshiping demons. That they just, but they they are bowing their lives to just their lifestyle, to the stuff of life, to a house, to a backyard, to their free time, to entertainment, to sexuality, just the, the pleasures of of life. They're just giving themselves to it. But everybody worships something. And because they do, because that's what they're worshiping, this is what's coming out in verse 21 of their life. Murder, sorcery, sexual immorality, thefts. It sounds like the evening news. It sounds like, well, I'm going to go and look at my news feed later and what I'm going to see. I just want to, I know we're a little bit right at time right now, but I want to go through the murders 
sorceries, sexual immorality, and thefts. Let me just look at these real quick. First, murders. They're almost so common today that it doesn't even phase us almost anymore, unless it's a mass shooting, right? Unless there's a school shooting, and then, oh, wow, it's really got our attention for like a day or two, a week, maybe, and then it's gone. Not to mention the 60 million babies that have been murdered since 1973. It doesn't even phase us. Second thing listed here is sorceries. Don't get the idea of pentagrams and seances and butchering chickens in your backyard. That might be part of it, but this has always been one of the most fascinating things about studying the Bible to me. Is that when the Bible speaks of sorceries, it's anything related to the occult. And the word sorceries is pharmakeus in the Greek. It's from where we get the word pharmacy. It's drug use. I think that people that say the Bible is irrelevant, they don't understand. Murders, drug use, being under the influence is a very literal and accurate description of what happens when we are using drugs. Drugs do more than, than alter your state of mind. It affects your soul. It affects who you are. Every time you are under the influence, you are giving control away. And yet there's those who are in the church who are unbelievably in the church that are promoting legal drug use and all of this. Third thing, sexual immorality. Again, going to the Greek is so interesting here. The word for sexual immorality is pornea. It's any sexual behavior that's outside of God's standard. Bestiality, homosexuality, pornography, adultery. God's standard is one man, one woman, one lifetime. Anything beyond that is pornea. It's sexual immorality. Again, the church has gotten slapped with this. I, I'm about to start preaching instead of teaching here. Don't watch it. Oh, Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's people, my friends, people I know, people I care about and love that are more concerned about hooking up Having sex, getting drunk, is exactly what the Bible is saying. This is not the behavior of a Christian. The fourth thing listed here is theft. It's attempting to gain possession of something that is not yours. It can take all different shapes and, and sizes. But sadly, if we look at the world today, we could almost say that the United States is a leader in each of these categories. Murder, drug use, pornography, and theft. So, what third, what half of the U.S. population is going to survive? Tough to say. So let me leave you with some application. Number one, pray for the lost. My my thought goes back to the beginning of chapter 8. Before the trumpet sounded, the prayers ascended. And all, it says, the prayers of all the saints came before God. That's us. That's our. We, we pray. We pray for the world we live in. We pray for these people that are just giving themselves away to, to drunkenness and sexual immorality and, uh, and murders. And just be, be praying for those people. If you remember in Genesis chapter 18, uh, it's such a great chapter teaches us so much about the character of God. The Lord and, and two angels come to Abram at his tent in, in Mamre. Uh, and uh, Abram gets some water, gets some food. They tell Abram and Sarah they're going to have a son uh, and be a child. And as they're about to leave, the Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? And he explains to Abraham that the clock has struck midnight for Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and the Lord lets him know this is what's going to happen to Sodom. And it's very much like what we read here in Revelation chapter 8. It's, it's their time to face judgment, fire, and brimstone. And Abraham didn't say, oh, man, they're getting what they deserve. I've been waiting for this moment. Instead, it says, 
in Genesis 18, Abraham came near and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He understood God's nature and God's heart is for people. So he prays this in verse 25 of chapter 18, far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And so Abraham's heart is to flee for the city. Here's this city. God says, I'm going to destroy it. And this, this, this city is full of sexual immorality, pornea, theft, murders, all of that. And Abraham's attitude is, oh, Lord, would you say that? What if there's 50? What, what if there's 45? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? What if there's 10? And this is the attitude that we need to have towards the world that we live in. Again, I gotta tell you, just personal confession time, living right downtown, across from the craziest bar in town. I need a little bit more of Abraham's heart in me, okay? Because at like 1.20 in the morning, my first thought is, I'm gonna pray for those guys, you know? <laughs> like, where's the fire and the brimstone? I'll do it myself, you know, man, gosh. <laughs> Jot down this. I, I, Many of you guys know this verse, Ezekiel 22, verse 30. This is what God says. I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. The Lord is looking for men and women in Ellensburg and Kittitas Valley to stand in the gap, people to make intercession for the neighbors, for the people at the 301, for the people that you work with, to just to lift them up in prayer. But too often, instead of lifting them up in prayer, like me with the people at 301, I'm, I'm too much like James and John in Luke chapter 9, when they are, Jesus and the disciples are traveling through Samaria, and they wouldn't let them have a place to stay there, and, and uh, James and John says, Lord, should we call down fire on them? It's like, no, he said, holy, that's, that's not the right attitude. He says, you don't know the manner of spirit that you are. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. The Lord wants us to have his heart towards people. Stephen Alford, who is a pastor of a church called Calvary Baptist Church in New York City throughout the 60s, was leading a leadership conference, and he was asked by a young student, what is the key to ministry and evangelism? And Stephen Alfred says this, and I hope you guys get this down. It's not complicated. He said, the key to ministry is bent knees, wet eyes, and broken hearts. This is what Ellensburg needs. This is what Washington State needs. This is what the United States needs. It doesn't need folks like us to be praying, it needs us to be praying, to be lifting people up, and not just the people that we like, the people that are nice, but the sovereign like people. And he's looking for those of us among us who will draw near and plead their case. Second point of application. God wants people to turn to him. I mean, he knows that we're worshipers. I mean, we read Psalm 115 this morning, and Psalm 115, verse 8 says, those, talking about idols, those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. We become like what we worship. And God knows that. He knows that we're only going to find our ultimate fulfillment in worshiping Him, being made into His likeness. And so the thing in, in your life that the enemy is trying to destroy you with is, is what God is trying to use to wake you up. The very same thing. The Satan wants to crush you, destroy you, that's what God wants to use to wake you up. And he will use whatever it takes in your family life, in your relationships, in your finances, financial situations, in your health, in your marriages. Whatever is going to wake you up from your spiritual apathy to make you concerned about the things of God. Here, and what we just read here, he let people be tormented for five months. That was his grace. That was his mercy. So that they could get a foretaste of hell and say, I don't want it. Whatever it takes to get them to call out on him. Third thing, uh, application is we need to get busy. We're believers. We have a job to do. Listen to what Vance Havner had to say. 
the real test of how much we believe prophetic truth is that we're is what we're doing to warn people to flee from the wrath to come to believe the solemn truths of prophecy and then make our way complacently through a world of sin and shame is not merely unfortunate it is criminal we need to pray not only stand in the gap for our neighbors and our co-workers and all these people we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would awaken a fire in us. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.11, knowing, not this down, 2 Corinthians 5.11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, this isn't a fairy tale that we're reading. This isn't something like, oh yeah, it's another Bible study. These are real events that are going to take place, and it should cause action within it. And Paul is saying, I want to spare anybody anyone from saying, why did I spend my money, my time, why did I squander my energy on all of this and the silly things of life? Paul says, I want to save people from that. And so we persuade men. And the call that we have on our life as we go from this place tonight is to live life on a, on a mission, to understand the greatness of the cross and the, and the, the wealth of and the value of the blood that was shed, and then live in light of it. And share that. Share that message. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Amen?